I'm gonna take it away. So I will be talking about taking care of patients in menopause. My name is Dr. Tatiana Cordova. I'm Associate Professor of the Department of, Department of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, this was brought up as far as the topic was because as primary care, we, we a lot of the times are the only doctors or the only providers that the patients see, or at least at the beginning. So I think it's very important to have the knowledge or the training to at least, if not treat, counsel the patients and guide them into the specialists that will be able to do so. I think overall, it's one of the, one of the things that we tend to not look at because of previous data that we'll talk about during the talk. So my objectives is for everyone to understand the diagnosis of menopause, the physiological burden that it can occur in the body, identify the options for treatment and management, discuss the indications and contraindications for hormonal treatment, as well as explain health maintenance and postmenopausal population and comparing the do's and don'ts when dealing with postmenopausal patients. There are 64 million in the, uh, women in the U.S. that are 50 years or older. 50% of the female population is 40 years or older. Life expectancy, as we know, it continues to increase year by year. In the U.S. alone, approximately 1.3 million women will, be, will go through menopause every year. In 2021, uh, women aged 50 and over globally accounted for 26% of all the women and girls. And this was up 22% from 10 years before. By 2025, 1.1 billion women will have transitioned through menopause. So looking at all of this, just the in their lifetime, a woman will spend 40% of their lives in menopause. So it's a pretty significant time that uh, people will spend in this transition or in this uh, period stage of their life. And I think it's important to, to be able to address it. As physicians, a lot of the times we're not, we're not ready for it. We're not able to, to provide this, uh, this treatment or feel comfortable. Uh, ARP published data, uh, survey data back in 2018, reporting that 80% of graduating residents did not feel comfortable treating menopause. Out of those uh, surveyed, 20% reported their residencies, their OBGYN residencies were offering menopause training, but only 20% of the residencies. Half of the residents expressed needing more education. In 2017, there was a cross-sectional anonymous survey that was emailed out to trainees at all levels in the U.S. residency programs, and this included internal medicine, family medicine, and OB-GYN. There were 703 emails that went out, 183 responded. Out of those, 34% responded they would not offer hormonal therapy to a symptomatic newly menopausal woman without any contraindications. 20% reported not receiving any menopause lectures, and only 7% reported feeling adequately prepared to manage menopause. So I think we're definitely not training our future workforce adequately to be able to manage this, or at least that's what the data shows back in 2017 and 2018, especially with the increased numbers that we're going to be seeing in coming years. So menopause itself, it's defined as 12 months without periods. It's a clinical diagnosis. There's no test. We'll have patients coming in and say, check my hormones. There's no level that, uh, that can tell you, yes, you're going through menopause or no, you're not, because it varies from patient to patient from day to day or within their, their ages across patients. 
a lot of the times they'll start going through what we call perimenopause sometime between four years to eight years prior to the final menstrual period. Uh, most of the time we'll see hot flashes as the, as the presenting symptom with 80% of the women developing them. But even then only 20, 20 to 30% will actually seek attention for, uh, for treatment because a lot of the times culturally or just over time, it's become a very much taboo subject to talk about. So a lot of the times they don't, they don't even mention it to us. On average, uh, menopause will occur around age 51. General symptoms, we talked about the hot flashes. Like I said, 80% of women will have at least one year duration of this untreated most of the time it'll stop between within four to five years but nine percent of these patients report having symptoms past age 70. They'll also have a regular menstrual cycle some hormonal fluctuation mood disturbances sexual dysfunction as well as cognitive changes. However the menopause related cognitive change or cognitive decline is uh, is more characterized by temporary absence of learning. And then once you go through postmenopause and you're in the postmenopausal stage, that ability to learn resumes. This is very much uh, different from age-related decline that starts after menopause, not really related to chrono, uh, more related to chronolog chronolog chronological age rather than the uh, last menstrual period, and it doesn't resolve, it just continues with the climb. We also see some physiological changes. One of the things that we see, or some of the things that we see is increased bone resorption, uh, leading to accelerated bone loss and also increased cardiovascular uh, risk. All of this occurring in the year leading up to the uh, final menstrual period. We see increases in their lipids, increased risk of metabolic syndrome, and increased vascular remodeling that occurs at midlife. All of this driven more from uh, menopausal transition than aging itself. One of the things that was noted, noted in, in the data is that for people that go through iatrogenically menopause, uh, meaning they undergo a bilateral ophorectomy, these women, because it's typically in the premenopausal period, they actually have higher cardiovascular risk than if you happen to go through natural occurring menopause later in life. This is a graphic from the SWAN study, the study of women's health across nation. It uh, summarizes and kind of uh, visually describes all the changes that occur during this transition. Um, some of the things I talked about and some of them uh, you can kind of read. The straw staging system is another way that people have looked at the transition. I'll show a bigger, bigger version of that graphic right there, so don't squint too hard on it. It was developed based on data from multiple longitudinal cohort studies. It was, it's uh, the gold standard for characterizing reproductive aging, but it's mostly used in, re in research, uh, not really recommended for clinical diagnostic criteria. But you can, if a patient comes, you can, and um, wants to talk about it, you can use it for counseling to kind of tell them, okay, you're in this stage or in that stage based on the symptoms. So as you can see, it's divided into seven different stages, range, ranging from the onset of menarche to uh, postmenopause. So I'll basically talking about the reproductive lifespan. Uh, it has all the different uh, criteria that we use for diagnosis. The green ones are your principal criteria, which is more like your clinical uh, symptoms, as well as the descriptive characteristics with the yellow being the supportive criteria, it's more of the labs, but like I said, and you can see the, the labs can be very variable and even normal, even at the postmenopausal uh, or perimenopausal stage. Uh, FSH is one of the ones that 
maybe changes a little bit more. We'll see some sustained levels nearing the final menstrual period. And then uh, we'll have some increases up to 70 to 100 followed by a decline. But again, it's not real clear, really defined when that happens in the person's lifetime and how it translates from person to person. So because of their uh, variability, it's not recommended to check FSH levels in patients. One study did suggest uh, that a random level of 25 and above in FSH is characteristic of menopause. And this could be useful. Uh, this is useful more in special situations that we'll discuss in later slides uh, rather than just for every single patient. So if you have someone coming to, uh, to your uh, clinic greater than 45 years old and has symptoms, they're more likely to be in uh, menopausal transition than they are to have a new endocrine disorder at this age. Always you wanna rule out pregnancy if they're sexually active and not uh, still having menses, even if it's irregular and uh, not using protection. FSH, as we talked about, it's not needed because it can be normal, however, if you have any other uh, concerning physical exam, exam symptoms, such as galactorrhea or tachycardia, proptosis, make sure that you also check your prolactin or TSH to make sure you're not missing something. For women that their only symptom is the irregular bleeding and they're greater than 45, uh, you may want to check the FHH in this woman because then at that point you're mostly working them up for AUB. Uh, and then you need to determine whether you need to consider an EMB to rule out hyperplasia or malignancy. But if you have a level of 15 to 25, it's more real reassuring that this is likely uh, menopausal transition, but even a normal FSH does not rule it out. For women younger than 45, you really want to work them up. If you have anyone coming with a regular bleeding with or without symptoms, you want to do a full endocrine workup, evaluate them for oligo or amenorrhea. Uh, menopause is still possible, but it's rare and considered early at this age, so other causes need to be ruled out. If you're less than 40, uh, and you are found to be in menopause there, then at that point you're considered to have primary ovarian insufficiency. There is some data that, uh, like I said earlier, there's higher cardiovascular risk factors associated with the younger population, and they actually get more benefit from uh, treating if they do have vasomotor symptoms and uh, treating them earlier. So what about these special situations that I talked about? You have women that maybe don't have regular periods like people with PCOS or hypothalamic amenorrhea or people that have gone hysterectomy or endometrial ab ablation. You may not be able to trust their patterns because they may not be having periods at all. In these cases, then you do, uh, you can consider doing an FSH. And if there, it's greater than 25, then especially if they're having symptoms, then they're probably going to transition or going into menopause. People that are taking OCPs, they may not develop bleeding or vasomotor symptoms because even that low level of hormone will actually keep those symptoms at bay. Uh, the FSH level is unreliable because at that point you have your hypothalamic pituitary axis being suppressed by the OCPs. You could consider stopping the pill and then measuring the FSH two to four weeks later. And if it's greater than 25, then yes, you're probably in menopause, but it really doesn't have an absolute reassuring again because of the variability of it. And then the other thing, if you stop these, uh, this medication on, women's like, on women like this, they may actually start having these motor symptoms and they may not be as happy patients to you. Uh, however, if they are taking it mostly for uh, contraception, uh, they can probably stop at age 50 to 51 because at that time, it's a very low chance that they'll get pregnant. So let's talk about the Women's Health Initiative uh, trial. Uh, we all heard about it. We all know about it. 
published back in 2002, uh, probably changed the practice of a lot of pay, uh, physicians at that time. Before its publication, treat, hormone treatment was widely accepted. It was safe. It was appropriate. They were using it not only for menopausal symptoms, but they were actually using it for cardiac protection and chronic disease prevention because they had, uh, they had some observational data proving this, even if you were asymptomatic. Approximately about 40% of women at that time were taking hormone, uh, hormone therapy. The study itself, it uh, revealed that the overall health risk succeeded benefits from use in co of combined estrogen plus progestin in healthy postmenopausal women. Uh, it found that the trial is not consistent with the requirements of a viable intervention for primary prevention of chronic disease. And the regimen should not be initiated or continued for primary prevention of uh, chronic heart disease. As a result, a lot of clinicians stopped prescribing hormone therapy. General practitioners had a steeper decline than OB/GYNs, with uh, family medicine and internal medicine prescribing about 18% of the, or writing about 18% of the prescriptions versus 82 of the OB/GYNs back in 2009. Looking at the trial itself, like we know, it compared the combined hormonal treatment with placebo. It found that the regimen increased cardiovascular disease, increased ca breast cancer risk, stroke, and DVT risk, uh, and it decreased color colorectal cancer risk, hip fractures, and total fractures. One of the things that was noted, even though it decreased the incidence of the colorectal cancer in the patients that it was diagnosed, it was actually diagnosed at a more advanced stage. Uh, the study itself, it had 16,600 postmenopausal women ages 50 to 79 with an intact uterus that were recruited by 40 U.S. clinical centers. Most of these women were largely asymptomatic. The average age of the participants was 63 and 66% of them were more than 10 years postmenopausal. You can see the breakdown of the age range after, or the time frame after menopause uh, listed there. The main outcome measure was primary prevention of chronic heart disease, and invasive breast cancer was the primary adverse outcome. There's been a couple of follow-ups since then, uh, including an analysis of subset data of the younger women uh, that participated in the study. And that one actually did not show an increased risk like it had actually uh, been published or previously been published. And it showed a strong trend to decrease risk, which was consistent to uh, the older observational data that was available. The elite trial, uh, showed no uh, serious adverse effects that were common and the rates not differing significantly between the estradiol and the placebo group. And this one looked into those that were less than 60 years old and started less than 10 years uh, from menopause. Uh, it looked at measuring the carotid intima media thickness by carotid ultrasound. The Danish osteoporosis prevention study uh, looked at women that were on average 50 years of age and within seven months past or on average seven months past menopause, and again showed significantly reduced mortality and hospitalizations from MI and heart failure. However, it was uh, strongly criticized because the there was no placebo that was used and uh, likely no sufficient power uh, for this study. Um, as the title suggests, the primary outcome of the study was more on bone health rather than cardiovascular health, but it was one of the things that they did note in their data. The Kronos Early Estrogen Prevention Study, or KEEPS, uh, did low-dose treatment of uh, estrogen or either oral or patch with oral progesterone. And again, they saw no significant effect on the carotid intima media thickness progression. 
You can see in this slide the incidence of the risks and benefits for uh, vasomotor symptoms or vaginal atrophy after treatment with uh, hormonal therapy. And this is again in women that are 50 to 59, less than 10 years from menopause. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrine and Metabolism, as well as it compares to the incidence of uh, adverse effects or adverse events. In 2022, the North American Menopause Society updated their recommendations, and this was uh, as an update to their previous recommendations from 2017. Uh, they reviewed all the available literature, including the Women's Health Initiative and data since, and conducted an uh, evidence-based analysis with the goal of reaching consensus recommendations for practice. The level of recommendations go from level one, two, and three, uh, very similar to our sort key recommendations with level one being a good and consistent scientific evidence, level two based on limited or inconsistent scientific evidence, and level three based primarily on consensus and expert opinion. The advisory panel was comprised of clinicians and research experts in the field of menopause and women's health. They looked at uh, all these different sections that apply to and how they apply to menopause, and they uh, release key points within each section, ranging from one to 20 uh, key points with various levels of recommendation. There's a total of about 100 plus, so I'm not going to go over all of them, obviously. Uh, level one, uh, there were 45, level two, there were 47, and there were 23, level level three, but I will summarize some of their statements. Uh, they feel like the session for therapy should be individualized to the patient with recommendations for use of appropriate dose and duration and regimen. Uh, we need to stratify the patients by age and timing before uh, counseling them and personalize the regimen and especially have periodic reevaluation of comorbidities and risk assessment as we continue the therapy. As we said, uh, pre, uh, women with premature ovarian insufficiency or early menopause have higher risk of bone loss, heart disease, and cognitive disorders. And all of this improves with estrogen therapy if you uh, continue it until the average age of menopause. They found that hormone therapy significantly reduces the diagnosis of new onset type two diabetes. Uh, this is based on women's health initiative data uh, that saw a 19% reduction in incidence in the estrogen progesterone group and 14% reduction in the estrogen group. Other studies have found similar uh, similar effects with about 30% reduction in them. The diabetes benefit, however, reverses once you stop the therapy. Even though estrogen is not approved for treatment of mood disorders, they did see some benefit in the depression with estrogen therapy for those women in perimenopause, but this was not seen for uh, women that had already gone through the menopausal transition. The effects of hormone therapy and cardiovascular disease may vary depending on when the therapy is started uh, relating to the menopause. And this is uh, this was seen in the early versus late intervention trial that saw reduced subclinical atherosclerosis progression in uh, those that were initiated within six years of menopause onset, but not in those that were initiated after 10 years. This one's the one that was, to me, a little bit controversial. Uh, they determined that pe women who are BRCA positive and have undergone risk-reducing bilateral oophorectomy appear to have similar effects from receiving hormone therapy, uh, just because we all know with the, and we'll talk about it later, uh, some of the things that you need to consider is your breast cancer risk because of the initial data that was published back in 2002. So that's one of the key points that was a little uh, 
a little weary about. They do mention that any consideration for hormonal therapy for estrogen sensitive breast cancer survivors and also for any uh, endometrial cancer survivals must be done in conjunction with the patient's oncology team and only considered if they've gone, they have severe symptoms and uh, we've tried the non-hormonal therapies and they have failed it. For women who initiate hormone therapy more than 10 to 20 years from menopause onset or greater than 60 years, the benefit risk ratio appears less favorable with greater risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, DVT, and dementia. Something that is mentioned is that based on the available data, there are still unanswered questions regarding the safety of uh, long duration hormone therapy use and the timing of discontinuation. And this is mostly because the most reliable data comes from the Women's Health Initiative study, but because of the initial findings, this was halted. So we only have uh, data that's limited to five to seven years of therapy. But this is the only study that we have that is how adequately powered, double-blinded, randomized control study. Um, so they consider it's not known whether women who initiate hormone therapy at the time of menopause rather than later and continue, it, uh, continue use of it uh, through older ages will incur the same risks as women initiating hormone therapies later in life. So how do we treat it? We talked about hormone therapy and I threw the estrogen and the, and the progesterone Estrogen really is the therapy, is the gold standard. Uh, all routes seem to be uh, equally effective, whether you do your oral, your transdermal, your uh, gel, your lotion, your intravaginal cream or tablet. All of them seem to, to be eff equally effective on symptom relief. Some of them are a little bit better as far as side effect or uh, adverse effect profile. And some some of them uh, you may not you may consider depending on the risks versus uh, like we will talk about the transdermal estrogen having less greater less risk of DVT and then once you calculate the cardiovascular risk which we'll talk about later you kind of say okay you can do oral or you can do uh, transdermal. One of the things to know in all women that still have a uterus, please use a progestin uh, in conjunction to your estradiol. And this is for prevention of endometrial hyperplasia. This can occur as soon as six months after use of an opposed estrogen. So it's really important. You wanna use the lowest effective dose that's recommended for the shortest amount of time and generally don't wanna do more than five years or not beyond age 60. Uh, you want to continue all your routine mammograms and breast exams that are uh, recommended in women, um, especially if they're taking hormone therapy. This, the tables that are going to follow in the next three slides and then maybe one more a few slides after, they're all from the AAFP, so you can, you can access them if you log into your account but they'll show the, the different options that we have for treatment. This one has the estrogen medications for vasomotor symptoms. So again, this is estrogen only. If you have a patient with uterus, we'll, we'll look at the next slide and uh, that was the combined, but it has all your different presentations, your different doses, and even the cost that it will, the patient will incur for a month's supply. And this is based on good Rx data from uh, 2016. This one is, like I said, it's the combination one. So you have your oral and your patches. Again, different, uh, different presentations and different doses along with the cost. So you can see even the cost itself uh, for the combined ranges, at least back in 2016, I, I check the current uh, price for the non-hormonal, but I didn't do it for this one. Um, but this one's what, 150, 130, 150 on average. And over here, depending on which one, you're still looking at at least 
a hundred on average, probably. Um, so something to consider, especially if, with funding. If you have someone that only has uh, genital ur urinary syndrome symptoms, so no vasomotor symptoms, you can do topical, uh, either cream or uh, the ring or even the ospemaphine that you can take orally. Some considerations if you're doing hormone treatment, uh, they are considered safe in healthy women, as long as you're doing them within 10 years of menopause and younger than 60, so, and they don't have any contraindications, and they have moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms. So again, only with symptomatic patients, uh, not asymptomatic. Your contraindications are history of breast cancer, which is why the previous slide with the NAMS uh, recommendation made me a little weary about it. Uh, history of heart disease or cardiovascular disease, previous CVT or stroke, active liver disease, unexplained vag vaginal bleeding, high risk of endometrial cancer or TIA. You want to avoid oral estrogen in women with hypertriglyceridemia or active gallbladder disease. And you want to do the transdermal estrogen in those that have migraine, head, migraine headaches with RM. So what do you do before starting? You, you need to restratify the patient, right? And you need to make sure that you include that in your counseling with the patient. The endocrine society suggests calculating your cardiovascular risk and your breast cancer risk before initiation of therapy. I'll show a picture of the of these two, but we're, we're all pretty familiar with the ASCVD risk. I think we probably use it at least once in a clinic session, if not more than that. Uh, the breast cancer risk is the one that we may not necessarily be super um, aware of, uh, but it looks at, the, it estimates the risk of developing invasive uh, breast cancer based on their age, the age of the start of menstruation, the age of the their first uh, live born child, um, the family history or previous breast history of the patient, whether they had a previous biopsy needed or if there was any abnormal um, tissue in that biopsy. Uh, it'll risk stratify it and you really don't want to do hormonal therapies for people that are high risk for cardiovascular risk or anyone that's moderate to high risk for breast cancer. This is what it looks like. Uh, the breast, like I said, the ACVD, we all know the A is the breast cancer one you can, you scroll down and then you look, they, it'll go through a series of questions and you put yes, no, or uh, put in the ages and then it'll, it'll give you a percentage risk. For your cardiovascular risk, uh, like I said, if you have low risk, you're pretty open in, the, in your options. You can do hormone therapy, you can do oral or transdermal. If you're more in the moderate section, which is five to 10%, you don't want to do oral. You really just want to do uh, transdermal and you need to counsel your patient as well. If you're high risk, definitely don't do any hormone therapy for these patients. For breast cancer, uh, low risk, you're good for using the hormone therapy. For intermediate, they recommend caution meaning that if they failed any other therapies or if they just don't want to do the hormone therapies, you really, they recommend strong consideration of non-hormone therapy. But um, if you are going to use hormone therapy, then you need to definitely counsel the patient regarding the risk-benefit profile and um, for symptom relief. And if you're high risk, you don't want to do it again. These are your our sort key recommendations again from the AFP article. Uh, systemic estrogen alone or in combination is the most effective therapy for menopausal symptoms. Uh, for grade B, combined estrogen progesterone therapy, but not estrogen alone, increases the risk of breast cancer after three to five years of use. Uh, there's no real evidence with 
the black cohosh, the botanical products, the omega-3 fatty acid supplements for the lifestyle modifications as far as alleviating your basal motor symptoms and uh, your grade C you really don't want to continue more than three to five years um, and you need to uh, review the risk and benefits with the patients. And uh, always, as with any other therapy, the lowest uh, effective dose for the shortest duration of time. So the non-hormonal treatment, I'm, I pretty sure most of us are more familiar with these and maybe a little bit more comfortable in uh, using these. Uh, you have your SSRIs and your SNRIs. Uh, in comparison to depression that you see the benefit, it was like, oh, come back in a month, month and a half. Uh, this one is, is within days. The paroxetine is the only one that has the FDA approval label for it. Uh, you really don't want to use it for women taking tamoxifen, but all the other ones are equally effective as well. Uh, the lafoxine is probably the one that's most studied, uh, but it has the higher side effect profile as well. Uh, gabapentin is a single dose at bedtime. It does relieve the symptoms. There is no evidence that whether you do gabapentin in addition to an SSRI or lafoxine, whether... Uh, that'll actually improve symptoms than just using gabapentin alone. You can do pregabalin, uh, but gabapentin is, is uh, more studied. And then clonidine is not one that we tend to use just because the side effect profile is not the best one. Again, back to our AFP tables, this is uh, all the, the cost incurred for their for the month supply for these. So in a lot of the times our patient population that may or may not have funding for uh, for these treatments or even some of the commercial insurances may not cover it as well. Cost may be something that you may need to consider in your discussion with patient. Like I said, uh, I didn't price the other ones, but this one stayed pretty close. Uh, so Taliprim, I found anywhere from 4 to 18. Uh, really, the most expensive one I see is gabapentin, and that was at $23. So they're, they're relatively or significantly cheaper than if you do the hormonal, even extrapolating the prices for um, from this table to the other one. But like I said, I didn't price the other one. These are the only ones that I priced. As far as your health maintenance, we all should know this. We all should have this memorized and ingrained in our brain. The USPSDF and AFP recommend against use of hormone therapy for primary prevention of chronic uh, diseases such as cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and dementia. However, we do recommend screening uh, for osteoporosis starting at age 65 or 60 if you have a high risk of fractures. Um, we do recommend screening for, uh, for use and counseling for cessation in all adults. And then those that have, uh, 20 pack year history and ages 50 to 80, make sure that we screen for lung cancer with a low dose CT, uh, aspirin use no longer recommended for secondary prevention, but, uh, only really considered if they have a history of cardiovascular disease in consideration with the uh, risk of GI bleeding. Uh, for diabetes, uh, recommendation is to screen uh, as part of the cardiovascular assessment in all adults ages 35 to 70. Uh, breast cancer, we recommend by biennial screening with mammography in all ages, in all women aged 50 to 74 with low risk for family history with consideration of early screening and those uh, with family history and those ages 40 to 49. And that second one is a grade C recommendation. Cervical cancer remains the same uh, as we all know, starting at 21 to 65, every three to five years, depending on whether you're doing co-testing or not, or how old the patient is. And the colorectal cancer, uh, 45 to 75, uh, the frequency will vary depending on which method and what findings they have.
So in summary, menopause before 40 is subnormal. Please work it up uh, even less than 45. Your stress stage, staging system is not considered a diagnostic criteria. It's more for reference and more for research purposes. Always rule out pregnancy if they're sexually active and they're not using any protection and they're still having menses, even if it's irregular. Um, menopause is possible at less than 45 years of age, but other causes need to be ruled out. Combine estrogen progesterone, but not estrogen alone, increases your risk of breast cancer when more when it's used more than three to five years. Uh, please add a progestin if they still have a uterus. Uh, try to do no more than five years, no, not beyond age sixty. Again, this is very much a shared decision making with the patient, and it has to be. Uh, reevaluated every year to reassess their their risks and comorbidities. There are some patients that will continue to have symptoms like I talked about. So risk benefit discussion and shared decision making with the patient if you're continuing past that time frame. Contraindications, uh, again, history of breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, previous CVT or stroke, any unexplained vaginal bleeding, or any high risk for endometrial cancer or TIA. Don't do oral estrogen uh, in people with uh, migraine headaches with aura, and transdermal has less risk of DVT. These are my references. I'll take any questions. I see a couple in the chat. Let me open that. Yes, it is the Gale model uh, risk. Uh, Tatiana, the uh, you had mentioned about treatment of women for uh, uh, BRCA positive. Um, and so, so I assume there's data to show that it doesn't necessarily greatly increase their risk, but they're already at increased risk. So you're right. giving, from a medical legal standpoint, you're given some, you're, you're part of a, that dynamic, I guess. Right. And that's why that that's why I kind of mentioned it as far as one of the key points, because it was actually a level one recommendation. Uh but like I said, it, as a physician, as a person that could potentially be prescribing this, I, I don't know if I would follow that recommendation, even with it being a level one, because like you said, they're already at increased risk. So I, I just don't think if I, I would do that. Could you expand a little bit? You were talking about premature ovarian failure and the importance of working that up. So if you find it, then what's the advantage of finding it that you treat earlier? Is that, is that? Yeah. Why you, yeah. yeah. So it's basically, if it is premature ovarian failure, uh, there is data suggesting that they're the longer they go through this period that they're the more risk that they will have. And there's more, there's data suggesting that if you treat it, up until the average age of menopause, the risk compared will basically go with the rest of the population. And by treating going it, through but, natural, I'm sorry. And by treating it, you're talking about uh, hormone menopause. replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're recommending uh, estrogen therapy until the average age of uh, menopause to try to decrease all of that risk. Mm -hmm. So to make sure I was like getting it right. Um, so treating menopause, it would be if they were symptomatic and not for cardiovascular um, benefit, right. but yes. was they were showing that there was um, cardiovascular risk and like dementia, decreased dementia benefit out of hormonal uh, treatment. Right. So 
And I'm trying to see, and I, the, I didn't include, because like I said, there were like a hundred plus recommendations out of that statement summary. Uh, as far as the dementia, they actually didn't see much improvement with hormone therapy on the dementia aspect of things. Uh, all of those, all of these um, review of data was more so to support the treatment of symptomatic women, not asymptomatic, because a lot of the, uh, a lot of us back with the data of 2002, we kind of stopped doing it. We we just stopped because of the the side effect profile that it came with with the WHI study. But like we talked about the group of people that were within that study were already at an older time frame of age. So even comparing a 50 year old to a 70 year old, the 70 year old without counting anything else is gonna have a greater risk. Mm -hmm. And the, the diabetes part, how um, once stopping it, it reverses it. I guess there, there would still be like a benefit. It's not, they're not like bouncing back worse in terms of their diabetes risk or A1C. Um, so the the reduction they saw was on new onset diagnos diagnosis. So there were less new diabetic diagnoses on people that were treated with uh, estrogen. And then once you stop that therapy, they kind of went back to the regular population risk. Oh, okay. Thanks. But I, I thought it was interesting because that one I didn't know. So that was something that yeah. uh, wasn't, wasn't a level one, but I thought it was interesting to mention considering a lot of our patients are that. Okay. All right, any more questions for Dr. Cordova? All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Dr. Cordova. Uh, we'll see you all, all again next week and have a good rest of your day. Excellent talk, thank you very much. No problem, thank you.